of you that have uh, been in attendance the others. We started off with a lecture by Carolyn Anderson, in which she talked about the crafts both in the colony and also in Sweden. And we had a lecture by Verla Hunter on herbs. The third lecture was by Phil Deach, who not only told us about raising broom corn and how brooms are made, but he demonstrated it. And now the fourth in our series for this spring. Uh, we're very glad to have with us today Kirsten Borsak. Did I pronounce that correctly? Okay. Uh, she comes to us from California. Kirsten was born and grew up in Sweden, came to the United States uh, uh, after she finished college. She tells me that she came here as a typical Swedish immigrant. She finished schooling, landed in the United States with $140 in her pocket. $104. $104. <laughs> I'm not, I won't make you that vote. And started working uh, as a housekeeper. Uh, she now lives in California, teaches fourth grade, and she is going to uh, uh, share some of her knowledge about the dairying in Sweden. Uh, I think one of the things that maybe quite a few of us know her by name through one of the books that she's written that's quite popular here, we have it in the store, Sing the Cows Home. So, Kirsten, we're very happy to have you with us today, and I'll turn the meeting over to you. Of course, I had to wear my home costume from my village. As you know, the most of the village north of uh, Stockholm in the northern area, most every village had their own costume. And those that don't have them are now going to museum and finding pieces and reconstructing the costumes. I am absolutely totally against that artificial Swedish costume, the blue, uh, uh, because it was created in 1904 by an artist and by a woman who was a home ec teacher. And she had found it was comfortable because it had bodies here and it hangs straight for when it was hot in the summer. So that was not a full costume, that's a creative one. But these go back hundreds of years. And afterwards, those of you who are interested in embroidery, you've got to come up and look. This is freehand embroidery by a lady who was 80 years old. I did not make my costume. The only thing that I made was this. So it has the black skirt and in the old days they had to stand and pleat them about three millimeter wide. And when it had rained, when they went to church on Sunday and the bike seat was wet, the women really hated that because that meant sitting down and then it would re and re-iron all of that while they had sat down. Nowadays you can't find anybody willing to pleat so it's woven in a pleated way. And then the apron it has the same pattern of embroidery as up here and on the back. The pin is handmade and these are handmade by a little man up in my village. And that's where my ancestors are. I did have four copies with me and I promised to sell them today with a signature in them. So uh, these are the, the book about which I studied. And I will sh start with the lecture first going into afterwards with the slideshow and then the music which is really unique because nobody else had music as a work tool except these women. So we go going back then to the province of Dalarna. You know, Stockholm is down here, Dalarna is coming here and then Hensel and going up. There was no uh, fair food system. The word fair food means cattle farm and that's the summer dairy farm. But I can't stand to say summer dairy farm the whole time. So called the Swedish word, which is Bavu. And southern Sweden, you see, was feudal. So there was no herding, so to speak. They might have taken them out a little bit. But northern Sweden, and on up into Lapland. But I concentrated only on my research on Dharana, since they are the culturally conservative area. And they kept it up. So up to today, it's about 130, 140 of them still functioning. They are not economically functioning enough, but they're functioning on an emotional basis. And we'll get back to that later. So going back now to back into the Viking Age and later, they don't know exactly when this system began, but 1200, 1300, Dalarna had what was called bog iron. They could go out with special scoops and scoop irons out of the bogs, easy to find, and that produced enough economy so they had an overpopulation, so to speak when the bog iron gave out. And the people had to support themselves. So each field, they would break the fields along the rivers first. And each field then had to be used 
for either oat or barley or rutabagas. There was nobody that could afford to grow hay in the, in the valley. So therefore, the women had to take the cows early, as soon as the grass got green, and it could be sort of April, May, depending on the year, they would have to take the cows up into the forest and leave that, live that alone for the whole summer. Sometimes they didn't get back as late as October until the grass was totally eaten up. My mother, when I was little, I heard about this. A woman had uh, gone up, and her husband had decided, and you know, in those days, men decided everything, right? <laughs> he had decided that she was going to stay up there, and rather than him taking the hay that he had cut during summer and transport it down, she might as well stay up there and let the cows eat that. She was also pregnant. She had a seven-year-old girl with her, and she left that girl when she felt it was due to deliver, and walked all the way down and delivered the baby when it was two days old, put the baby on her back, and hiked back up, knowing her seven-year-old daughter, this was December, and it is dark in Sweden in December, would be afraid. And unfortunately, I had frozen ice on a lot of cliffs, so long stretches she crawled on all four up the mountain and back up into her family. So, but as I said, most of them brought, went back down into the valley, like September, and then it depended on year later and later <coughs> came down. Earlier. But these women up there developed a folklore that was totally unique to themselves because they never lived totally alone. They would cut down an area, X number of farmers, and say, this is our settlement, favorite settlement. Some would be three houses, three cabins. Others, the biggest one was 46. They would take the house in the village that got too old, number the logs, and then in the winter time, transport those logs up, and there put the number already, and put it back up. Those houses are, are quite interesting, because they are sturdy logs, and it's a rounded log, so there's no, no need to chinking or anything, and they were heavy. And up there, they would have the one house for the woman, and it's not big. And then outside, she would have the log cabin dug down into the ground about this much to stay cool. And that's for the thickest log, and that's the store room for all the things that she made during the summer. She would then make butter and cheese and whey butter. That's boiling the whey down for seven hours until it's sort of a thick brown paste almost, and that is absolutely delicious. But the women then that had to travel up and be there, I was interested in who were they, because up to 1880 they had to fight wolves, they had fought bears, and they had to solve all the problems on their own, whether it was a broken leg among themselves or whatever. And I was interested in who these women were. And the women of this province, Dalarna, were more independent, certainly than one who were feudal system, that would walk to the manor house and work X hours there and be a subservient to the husband. These women grew up, so from the 1770s, they were out on work wanderings. That meant the population was so heavy that they had to go out and t seasonal jobs outside. The women during the summer, this is the unmarried group, would walk to Stockholm, for example, and get jobs at, as dairy maids or uh, work in museums, working, rowing boats over the waters and so on, summer jobs and coming back for the winter. Some of the men would leave, a lot of the men would work leaving and work and shoveling snow in Stockholm and coming back. Ninety-four of this work, percent of this work wandering group came from Dalaran. Then we have also gone back even further, the women were independent businessmen because men would go out and sell, you know, the dollar horse turned out to be a toy in the beginning. But the women, you know, long hair, they collected the hair from the hairbrushes and made jewelry. It's a complicated method of macrame almost, and they made jewelry. And I researched, some walked as far as Lapland and sold it. Others have walked all the way to Paris, crossed over to England, some have walked up to Glasgow. But the ones that admired most walked all the way to Moscow and then back. And these were independent business women from 17, 1800. So even if you didn't do it, you always knew of somebody when you grew up as a girl there that had gone and done that. And also the women, Alana, they were never told who to marry. Whereas in the southern Sweden, you know, the parents arranged it. They, she was always asked and she could say no one that was respected. So in that aspect, 
we have a group of very independent business women that also got known for their wit. And lots of funny stories they have that big wit as women have to do in the business world to get back and get their own footing, so to speak. So the women were independent, and on top of that, they admired their culture and they were culturally conservative. This is the area where our poor costumes still was used until the 60s came and it became fashionable all over Sweden again to go back to your roots and remaking your costume. But Donna had used it all along and you have probably seen the boats going to church with all the costumes and so on. So this is the culturally conservative area. That's also why I think we can find the, the material culture being so conservative. You see, a lot of these women were hired for the summer and that's young unmarried girls. But a tremendous amount, I found out, were grandmothers going up with the granddaughter. And she was training the granddaughter to be the milkmaid and to do the things. And there you have a tremendous respect for grandma. I talked to women who were 80, 90 years old and said, you see, I did it this way because grandma did it. And I still did it this way all my life because that's the way grandma did it. So there is the respect for uh, keeping up with the tradition. It didn't change into, way into this century. The women that, if we should describe the whole herding system, it is Bufering's day. That's the day they would walk up to the mountains. A cow can walk 18 miles a day. So those who had more than 18 miles up, those who had 56 miles, they had to stay overnight. And that was all established through routine and tradition while they stayed. But most of them could make it up in one day. And the night before, the young mate, girls who had been hired and it was an honor to be hired because the farmer who wanted to hire a girl would look at one who was clever and could do good cheese and working, but also knew her way in the forest. That was vitally important that she would lose any of the calves. Economy depended to a large degree on the cattle, and they kept them alive over the winter, not necessarily to get milk during the winter. There are, you know, the barns, I will name, and there's a cook right over the stall for the cow. And that was because they were so weak, they couldn't stand up. They had to put a band under and hoist them up in spring and carry them out when the grass finally turned green in the spring. They gave them mosses, the sorghum mosses, you know, kind of white moss on the ground, and they gave them branches, and they would strip anything they could, the buds of the birch trees, to keep them alive over the winter, to, in order to produce as much as possible in the summer. So one calf cow was extremely economically important. Therefore, you had to hire a girl that would be sure not to lose any of the cows and you had to find that way. So they had a party. Every, everywhere I was researched, the night before they had a party and they usually danced all night. The family, the housewife and the, the farmer, would have everything packed. And you see, you can't forget anything at home because it's too far to go. So they would have that ready and have to pack, and usually three or four in the morning, they started. It's not dark, you know, in Sweden, in the summer it's sort of around midnight, a bluish twilight, but it doesn't get dark in summer. So they would walk up, and they would walk up, the goats were the worst, they all said, because they wouldn't obey. The calf had traditionally a lead cow, and that lead cow would get the big fair bell that was only used up in the mountains. And the families recognized the sound. I came into three sisters that have had a fair boot. They're all in their 80s. And one of them said to the youngest one, said, go out in the barn and pick the fair boot bell. And they said, our lead cow dropped it one year. And we had to make a new bell. But then two years later, we found it. The sister came in and it rang once, one thing. And she immediately said, no, no, that's the wrong one. That's the, the, the new made one. So she had to go back and get the old original one. One cling and she knew the sound. So all of them recognized the, the neighbor's lead cow by the bell. And it was never ever used in the valley because it is a certain tone. And of course, it's a lot of witchcraft connected with how to make the really good bell and so on. Why do you offer a silver spoon to line the inside of the bell in order to make it sound really well? So the lead cow knew who she was, and they traditionally kept it up year after year. And they would then walk the cows to the rest of the wood follow, except they had to walk with the goats and chase the goats. 
all the kids would be following, the housewife and everybody walked along. And then they would meet, because not necessarily that all the settlements in Kerr would come from the same village, but they had agreed on one day to go up. Of course, you could never go up on a Thursday, because the trolls were out on a Thursday. <laughs> or on back to back to Christmas Day, Christmas Day was on Wednesday, you couldn't go up on a, on a Wednesday. There were lots of traditions, variation between the villages. So they would walk up and the girls would sing. As I said, they had, the cows recognized their own girls very quickly. And they had songs without words, but they're calling songs, and I have them on tape. And then when they came up to the fair wood, the old days, they danced the trolls out. And the lady that I talked to first was in 76. She said her grandmother, she was trained by her grandmother, she danced the troll out. So the first thing she did when she opened the fair wood door, she said, I can't remember. I didn't pay attention, I was six, seven years old, but grandma always danced the trolls out because the belief was once you left in the fall, the trolls moved in and stayed there over the winter. So you danced them out, and she said her grandma would never pour water on the ground without warning the underground people, the little victor people. So they had to move so that she wouldn't defend them. And you, you know, there were a lot of ideas you couldn't walk here and there because that was the victor trail, and so on, except you couldn't see them. So. There was a lot of confusion in that. And then they had to take all the wooden vessels, you know, the bowls, and sink them in the creek so that they would swell up again because during the winter they would crack. And they would take uh, juniper branches open and boil them in water and then take them up and soak them in that water because it smelled so good after that. And then was, of course, uh, settling the cows in. They seemed to have known within two, three kilometers of the fair wood that so they recognized and would race up to the fair wood. So it wasn't just the women that liked being up there, it was the cows too. The men would stay there. They would have to check that the bridges had, had were repaired, the fences that were needed around the fair wood settlement because they had a pen that they kept the cows in the morning. They would milk them, send them out into the pen. And then the woman living on the highest fair wood, she would sing, leave the take the cows out melody. And this next fair wood settlement, some miles down, would repeat it. So they would repeat it. And they would time oriented. Swedes have time on their brain. There's no question about it. If they say five o'clock and you arrive five minutes before, you better walk around the block a few times because you arrive at five. And even up there, they were absolutely at six o'clock, they most of them they would leave, leave the cows out. And therefore the fences had to be repaired. The men cut the firewood too. And it was really a dishonor if his whoever it was up there that he had hired or his mother-in-law, whoever took the job, had to do the cutting of firewood. And they cut the birch, it burns hot and slowly. So and it's also very hard wood to cut. So the men would do that and then everybody left. Then the women settled in to their whole summer of being their own boss. And I think that we haven't quite understand how important that was to those women. There was, at home they were somebody's wife or somebody's grandmother or somebody's daughter and they had a position there. When they came up, they, they were free under a certain framework that these were the jobs that had to be done. As I said, they had to hurt all day long until 1880s, 1890s, it's hard to say, when logging began and that scared the wolves off and the wolves got shut off. And the bears were also a, a tremendous problem for them early. So what they did, they teamed up. If there were five women living in the, in the settlement, they would take one day each and take all the cows. And they had their borders so well established that on Tuesday uh, you let them go here and graze. On Wednesday there and so on. And on Sunday they kept them close by because nobody heard it on Sunday. That was sort of the day. So the woman that then went out with them in the morning, she would knit as she walked. I think Swedes knit whenever they sit down, even today. And she would knit as she walked, and she would keep them together with her music. And at noon time, the cows would rest, and they always had an established spot, and they started a fire, put on some fresh spruce branches, 
to make as much smoke as possible to try to get the mosquitoes away. I mean, you can never win that battle, but at least you can get them further away. And then she would take up and she would sew them. If she was employed or a daughter, she had to sew so many shirts during the summer. And then in the afternoon, she would walk with them again and two is four o'clock in the evening she would be back home, then they milked. The ones then that were at home had to clean their barns, they had to do the cheese from the day before the milk, put in the remnant, heat it, make the cheese, and then take the whey and collect it until they got enough. They didn't have enough whey until every fourth, fifth day, and then took a big cast iron pot and had to boil it for seven hours. In the first few hours, you don't have to stir it, but the last four hours, you stirred constantly so it wouldn't burn in the bottom. And I managed to find one of those big wooden spoons, and it's sort of slanted. You can see where the edge had been worn out when stirring. The way butter that got burned a bit, or not so good, they called fiancé way butter because she was daydreaming and her bo boyfriend was stirring <laughs> Then when it had boiled down, so they thought, then it was very important not to shake the house. or They had to sit absolutely still or else they would, would get grainy. I don't know if it's true, but they all believed it, so they would let it sit there until it totally cooled. There was, uh, Lisa and I was the first woman, as I said, that I talked to, and she said that her grandmother trained her, but grandma died when she was 11 during that winter. So she was 11 when she was alone the first summer. And she said she had to get up at four because she had seven cows and she was not that fast at milking. And she said, my arms ache, she said, from milking most the whole summer. She would take them out and then have the three other women in the settlement. And she said, they knew that I was homesick. The other two of them were very old. And she said, oh, I wonder what they're doing at home. And they had a trick. So they had shipped a piece off the table and <coughs> made some coffee and drank out of that and then she wasn't home sick any longer. Her sister came up because during July the men came up and they cut all the hay on every bog and every little area that they could and that was the winter hay so they tried to put it on the storage which is called the back there and eventually put it in special places where um, they stored it and took it down on sled in the winter. That's the time that women had the most fun because they were really interested in partying time. And it seems to be a, a tremendous summer feeling of, of greatness and fun. They would be up there, they would play practical jokes, and they dance basically the whole night during that short haying season. And you see, the Dalana. The women inherited too. In southern Sweden, the oldest son inherited farm. The rest of you, you go find your own job, so to speak. But in Dalarna, the farmer would split each field if he had two kids in half. And they, in turn, would split theirs according to how many kids they had. So one farmer had to walk 68 miles between strips. Some of them had fields that were one yard wide. That's what they had inherited. Until 1820, it took to 18, from 1820 to 1880 to reorganize and reallot all of the farmland and the hay land of Andorra so that they combined and got bigger pieces again. And then after that, they, they couldn't cut it up. My grandfather, for example, inherited, and it was so complicated. He bought the land for one, 20 cents. It was easier that way so he could build his house after he retired on the piece of ground that they inherited because it was so extraordinarily complicated. So haying was fun, and haying was also party time and dancing. They seemed to have danced on the house that had the flattest floor, and if there was none such, they danced outside until the sun went up again. Cowhorn is one of those instruments that was used sometimes as a dance instrument. And one man now, that there are very few in Sweden that knows how to look for the cowhorn, he says, I am absolutely worn out. My lips are gone after two songs. I do not know how that woman could play her dance songs the whole evening. And others said, oh, we liked it when the boys came from this and this village, because they were more handsome. Or when they came from that village, they usually had a fiddle with them. And don't think that the girls were practical, because they would go down to where the trail came up, and when it would branch up to this fairwood, they would lay as many spruce twigs right side up as there were unmarried girls up there. And every boy that walked up would turn one upside down. So the boys that came after and all the twigs were upside down would walk to another fairwood. <laughs> That's 
female organization. As I said, some of the older ladies were not so fond of the young ones, and one said, oh, it was such a good summer, so-and-so wasn't out there. She was so strict, and she kept us under such control. The women then, uh, the, whenever they had visitors, they took down the cheeses, the butter, and the whey butter. But those who were 50, 60 miles out basically got just visitors during the haying season, and they took it home. So in the fall, then there was a big event. They would come from the village with the pack horses. You know, the trails aren't wider than that, so you can't do anything else but have pack horses. And they would walk down then. Uh, pack horses loaded and the men had backpacks carrying all the different supplies with them. And when they walked down, they had a cow, a bell around the cow, which had lots of, of uh, little pieces of cloth to decorate it. And the lead cow was then called the bride. And that was a big event walking down into the village at the end of the fall. And the women then who had been up there, if she was employed by a farmer, it was important to show off how much she had made and how much she had produced. Because if, if a cow had gotten diarrhea, they don't produce much uh, milk at all. And there are several of plants growing up there that do give the cows diarrhea. Man could, for one of them, uh, get the cows quite sick. So the girls had quite a responsibility to keep the girl cows healthy. And when it comes to that, they had a lot of knowledge in what to do if they got sick or the cows got sick. Lisanna, who was not 11 the first year, her cow was bitten in the face by a snake. And it obviously was quite sick immediately. <clears throat> the neighbor lady said to her, run down to this and this village, which was a long hike down. No, they said, we don't have anything. Go over to the next village. And that was a hike across the fields and over. And there, a lady said, no, go over to Finn so-and-so. He has ermine meat, but you can borrow my bike. And she said, I got the bike. I rode over, and the old man was hard to deal with, but yes, he finally agreed. He gave her some and gave the instruction what to do. So she put it in her apron pocket, pedaled back, and she said, that lady gave me a bowl of blueberries with milk. And then I do a high, small running all the way up. And she came back in the evening, and the cow was laying on the ground, and she thought the cow was dead. He had given an early meat, and she was told to lift the head of the cow, stick it down as far as possible, and stroke the cow, keep the mouth shut so swallowed, and then milk the cow and let the cow drink its own milk. And two days later, the cow was fine. <laughs> they were tough women. As I said, the one that gave birth and hiked back up, there was some that gave birth up there and they got back up working two days later. Uh, one lady that I talked to, she showed me the creek and she said, my grandma was carrying me, I was three years old, and she was going to jump over the creek, slip and broke her leg. And do you think they all offered you know, to ride, run down to the village to get some of the horse? Oh no, grandma was up in the mountain for summer. She took some old swaddling clothes, hooked her feet into something and pulled it to, so it snapped. Then she tightened the swaddling clothes and something else, she didn't know what. And she stayed out the rest of the summer. But she did accept a horse to ride on on the way down at the end of the summer. And she said, I guess it healed all right. Well, she was still walking the three miles to church when she was in her 90s. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of superstition, of course. And I went and looked at the brick in there that has an impression of the scissors. And my little mind said, click, click, click. You see, they believed in trolls up to the turn of the century. Now they're talking that the districts outside, I can never pronounce that word, it's for rural. My kids say I'll never speak English right. Uh, the people in the cities, public education came in 1848 to Sweden, but that was in the cities. But out, out in the smaller communities, there were people up to this century that believed in the trolls. And the trolls were not only the one, there was the Randa and the underground people, the Indra and the, so on. So they believed in that. And in the spring, when they take the cow cows out for the first time, they would leave something in the threshold, sharp, preferably scissors then, or if they've broken some the knife off on the threshold and the cow would step over it. And therefore, if it had stepped over the sharp steel item, the trolls couldn't touch it touch the cow in the summer. They would paint a cross of star or tar over, or they could drill a little hole and put mercury in. Those were also protective. 
and there were Daphne and Valeriana, those two herbs, would tie it around the, the neck of the cow, hang it on, on their band, then she was protected from the, the trolls or the Vitra and Randa, and so on. And the same thing you see when a baby was born, it was considered heathen, and so the mother until they had been, the baby had to be baptized and the mother had to go through a ceremony in the church, taking them back into the church. So in the crib was always placed a pair of scissors, someplace, or a page out of the hymn book would also work to protect the child from the trolls. And the mother who had just given birth had the same thing if she had a scissors in. So I was wondering what that impression of the scissors in a crib is kind of. That is some connection because it was definitely a tremendous amount of folk beliefs. Uh, Professor Till Hogner came up, he had boxes of three by five cards with all the, on each card was one right surrounding childbirth or up to a child who was one years old, and he must have thousands of these. So, whatever they did, they did with such intensity, their life was sort of controlled by all these superstitions that we say now are superstitions. But these women, follow those rules. I have on the slides other things that I can show you how they protected their cows in the summer and that was so vitally important. So okay, I think I'll show you the slides now. on the southern side, near the north, because the snow stayed on so long. And it would face down, and they took a piece of homesick if they could see their home. And at the front, you see that special fence made out of sticks. And the, you just lean them. Thank you, that shows me. And as you can see, the belief in the troll was quite valid. Here is a typical fable. At the turn of the center, Dalana had about 2,000 of them, and right now it's about 160 left. And they're left now for an emotional reason, because Grandma doesn't think it's summer unless she gets to go up there. And that's the barn. And a lot of those barns had to open bigger doors, because the cows 150 years ago were the size of today's calf. And this is, you can see, the walkway out. So on the left are all the fair food, and you can see a little bit, and they are on the way walking out of there. And the girl on the fence has a lure, that's what used to scare the wolves with. They never went up in the close combat with the wolves, they were very scared of them. And some have written, she said, I had to blow that lure every, the whole day because the wolves were just sneaking around, and my lips hurt for days afterwards. They went in close combat with the bears, one woman, uh, got angry, a bear got hold of her cow, and she took off her bonnet and hit the bear over the face, saying, this cow is mine, and the bear obviously took off. <laughs> Another time, the girls had a problem with a bear who had killed, and this is unusual, so it must have been uh, a sick bear, had killed a cow and would come back in dusk and eat all the carcasses. So they sent a message down the mountain uh, by calling, and they had a certain system of that. So the men came up, and in those days it was only one man per county that had been had allowed to have a gun, and he was the official hunter, and he was gone someplace. But you know, Swedish men always had the aquavit with them, right? So they put a cast iron jacket down, have wind ground, put some of their precious aquavit, and the bear came, sniffed, and drank it all, and got very happy, sat back on his haunches, and fell asleep, and that's when they went in with an axe and killed him. <laughs> And there you see, they could get lost, and they did get lost, and the women had to really know their way in the forest. Because in the fall, the cows would not come home. You see, after the danger of the wolves and the bears, they would just lead them out in the morning and sing them home at night. But when they liked mushrooms, and then they would not come back at all in the fall, and then the women had to hide. There was one woman who said, I remember I was six years old, I had a walk, and mother carried the little, two little ones, and her singing was so penetrating, and we would go up and sing, and walk further and sing, and then finally the cows answered, 
and we knew we were safe, she said, and then had to return at night and the whole way. So the women really had to know the way in for us. This is the oldest kind of, of fair wood, and there's a, the floor on the right one is just dirt, and then in the center on the floor is the fireplace. There is just a little vent, as you can see at the top, where the smoke went out, and then a little wind eye, wind erga, where is the English word got this word, word in, window from. Wind eye went to England and became window, and that's the little opening, as you can see. And my son and I slept there, the benches on the side, and we tried to let the smoke go out because the, the fire go out because the smoke bothered us, really. Then the mosquitoes came in, so then we had to start the fire and fill the place with smoke again, so we didn't see much. And on the left is the storage room, cool and tight, and that's where the cheese and the butter and the whey butter are stored. So this is from a photo from a book at the turn of the century, and this is what, the way they lived. They slept on the side and had the whey butter sitting over there, and of course, while she, it's cooking, she's knitting. I just took that along because I think she looked so proud of her place after there. And these are the barns, and as I said, they had to open them larger because today's cows are much too big for the barn doors. So today's calf is the size of a cow then. Lisanna, who started being up there by the time she was 11, she spent 61 summers up there. And now she says, when I'm old, it's comfortable because they all use them now for summer cottages and this logging room so she can get driven all the way up and she doesn't have to hike up anymore. And in front is Queen Anne's Lace. This is a habit that they all seem to have had. They brought with them one piece that was really beautiful and that was the bedding. And nobody was ever allowed to sleep in that bed, bed but they had it. And one woman said, my grandmother's generation was cross-stitched, my mother it was embroidery, and my generation was lace. And they brought that with them and never let anybody sleep. So there was one bed that reminded them of home. And this is a demonstration table, so if you want to go up there to the class, you can learn to milk the cows at hand. And I took the picture because it's three generations of two. You have the old wooden two, you have the metal two, and then the modern plastic. And the Swedish folk art is beautiful. This is a stereotype container to milk into. And these are the butter mold, and they would always carve the design so that they would stay in there for a few days until the cheese hardened. Oh, this is cheese mold. And then they would have a design on it. The little one was the last day the girls were allowed to take them you know, for themselves and make baby cheeses, little cheeses. And when they came down to the village, all the boys expected to get a taste. And if a girl gave a whole cheese to a boy secretly, then she, he knew that she was fond of him or loved him. So that's how she got the message she brought. And that's what they needed um, the <coughs> butter in. And I think just those are so beautiful that that class is still making them today. It's a butter container. And this is a birch bark backpack that my son wore. And you can see it's been used a lot of time and it's still up there. Because the people still use them and still go up with, with you know, I had an old couple with me and they're saying, oh yeah, I made this spoon when I was young. And it's sort of contact with the past. This is a gnurka and the sweets and coffee, you know, that's the same. So that's a coffee grinder that they had with them up. They only drank coffee on Sundays. They had what is called a bomerke, like a, a brand, but it was used not on the cows, but it was used on tools and would be woven into blankets or made into socks and so on, and on legal documents and on gravestones. So it stayed with the family, and if the daughter inherited it, the goat farm, and her husband would then be called, he had a petticoat name, because he would take that farm's uh, sort of sign and more. And their Anna Ulstotter, AOD, had been there four summers. The, these women used knives all the time and they carved, they carved messages, they carved long verses and so on. I found one verse by a man saying, we've been here 
It was stayed in seventy nine or something. We have been here for four days and only got one little stack of hay. Only God will know what becomes of us. And another woman said her uncles came up and they spent two weeks up there, got no hay together, so one of them emigrated to America, got so angry. Here you have a te uh, they have woven uh, some discs out of horse hair and then they strained the milk through that. And if it went through the sign of the cross, it was protected from the trolls. And that's the tea bust that the, um, the trolls don't like. So if you wore a piece of that plant on you, you were protected from the trolls. And here is a whole, and I read the, a lot of research, it goes back hundreds of years, and it's a natural little sort of circle in the rock. And they tossed in, if they had five cows with them, they tossed five pine cones. If they all landed inside, then it was safe. But it goes back, so this was an offering place to the, whenever you took a trip, you offered to round up the forest lady. She was absolutely voluptuous and beautiful. Blonde, long hair, sweet, but she had no back. She was hollow in her back, and she did a lot of mischief. And the goats were a nuisance to all of them, but they gave, that's a poor man's cow, you know. And they had bells, too. And here's one little one at the, in the 1890s picture, and she was hurting already at that age. Into this century, they just walked the cows out in the morning, sand them home. And here is how they you heat the um, water before making cheese. Fill the milk. And that's, she has put the rennet in, and she's using the top of a pine tree, so that was a stirring tool. And if you, when well, you're just cooking all meat, you took a tiny pine tree and made it and peeled it. So that's a craft that it's called. She's making um, cheese there. And the same picture I took it in 80, and the same method. And that's what a uh, whey butter looks like when we more than seven hours. And it's sort of pasty, it's extremely good. And that's today's girl with a plastic apron learning to make them churn butter. And I like that photo because it, it describes the old days, hard work and standing with her logs to keep the fire going under the way better. You see, it's 1749-46, the knowledge of the Viking alphabet was still in use. And behind this is, uh, I didn't realize when I took a photo of the first ones, or a lot more of the other ones. As I said, men and women, they carved us in every, every place where they could. And here you see 1843, and then, the initials of whoever have been up there. This was the turn of the century, it's Sunday, and they had always one clean apron and a better dress than they wore on Sunday and then drank coffee. Or they danced. This is during haying season. And if they had somebody to play, they would dance. And a lot of practical jokes. She could blow the lure that they scared the wolves with, and it could also be used as a megaphone, and that's what they used when they needed a message of emergency down. And there was one special melody, if they didn't have that, that they drew that meant it's emergency. And today, the same instrument, two yards long, and it's only used by men as a sort of folk festival instrument. And this is the cow horn. I have one with me. They would take the wick outside, then you let hang the corn over where it balances to drill the first hole, then you drill two more holes. You can never play two together because they are not in the same key. But this particular one had been used over 200 years because it was extremely good. And I have the cow horn melodies on, on the tape. And I was really proud. My son is turned out, he's totally American, but he's more Swedes than most. He sold his own folk costume. And he drilled and made that instrument, and he gives lectures now, blowing that. Although a good woman would never blow it indoors because that was bad luck. Mm -hmm. It was an outdoor instrument that was used only at the mountain. At the valley. And that's, you see, how you get quarter and half notes. They glide them. So the only three holes on the top. And this I just love. That's the entertainment at night. 
whose books have had, but young mothers that the kids with and put the kids to bed, and then they sat and told folk tales and sang, but never sang uh, in group, but always one at a time. And now she's sitting five minute break and out with the needles and the needle. That's how the cows were de bells were decorated for the lead cows on the hike down, and they were treated with parties at home and with special recognition. They're walking down, and mother's kneeling while they're walking. This is the same area where I am from, but you see that the difference is enormous in the costumes. And the woman on the right, she is the one that had been up at the mountain, and she gets to wear the costume that you wear only on Christmas Day and on special weddings and so on. And they, they honored the women that have been up uh, at church that first Sunday home because they had been the outstanding women. And you can see it's the same village, but it's a special bodies onto the uh, special apron for the ones that have been buried up to the up. Okay, now I'll put on the tape. Thank <laughs> you. 
entertainment. The herding songs were not endless, it, they just made them up. But the folk songs they sang at night. And um, this first one is, it's 12.30, don't go yet, she says to her boys, but you're reading their hands wrong on the book. Thank you. 